Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Xiaobing, for the very kind introduction. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, really wonderful to be here. For, my, it's my first time to Manchester. Uh, and yesterday I was here and I learned actually that, um, you know, Marx and Engels spent time here and some of the Communist Manifesto actually was inspired and, and written, uh, which actually connects to some of the content um, that, I'll, that I'll be talking about today. Um, so the book, Mao and Marcus, The Communist Roots of Chinese Enterprise. Um, so I am not a traditional China scholar, actually. So I'm, my PhD is in sociology, particularly the study of economies and organizations. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, about 10 to 12 years ago now, I started doing a lot of research uh, on China based on my interest in really understanding environmental sustainability issues, uh, social responsibility, uh, those are really important issues in China at the time and continue to be. Um, and in, you know, unlike the West, you know, the Chinese government can have a lot of um, you know, sort of power to actually make changes, which I think you know, in many cases they have. Um, but part of these last you know, 12 years, a lot of the work I've done in teaching is taking students to China. And you know, in many ways, this, gra this sort of um, graph encapsulates a puzzle that so many of my students had. So these students were not Chinese. They were, you know, I, as you can tell, even though I'm at Cambridge now, I'm actually not someone who's originally from the UK. I just arrived in Cambridge actually in 2022. Uh, prior to that, I spent most of my academic career, um, you know, in the US, although I have, you know, lived about four years in China teaching uh, mostly at uh, Shanghai Jiaoda, but also did some teaching at Peking University on uh, a university in Chengdu. Uh, but when I would take students to China, so these were students that had never been to China for the most part, mostly had, you know, understood China through the Western media. Uh, and we would go to, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, you know, that see these, you know, amazing buildings and, and, uh, and incredible infrastructure and you know, we would actually send them out to do field work and you know, go and talk to you know, entrepreneurs on the street and, 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 and businesses. And invariably, uh, the students would come to me, some students would come to me at some point in the program and say, do you know what? China is not really a communist country, um, you know, which really sort of, because I think in the West, at least what the media portrays, I think very much relates to you know, the experience of the Cold War against, with the Soviet Union um, and, um, and, and, and not necessarily as much about the economic vibrancy um, and, you know, markets that are there. Um, and so this really very much, I think, motivated a lot, of, uh, a lot of the work that I've done to try to, you know, understand the political economy of China, and particularly as it relates to business activity. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the research I do looks at actually firms themselves and their strategies and behaviors, and that's some of the evidence that I'll discuss to you. So this graph here, you know, really, you know, looks at the, you know, shows this GDP rate, 9.25% um, over 40 plus years, which is, you know, unheralded in, in U.S. history, uh, you know, Japan and Korea over the last number of decades had, um, you know, impressive growth streaks, but nothing compared uh, to what China has done, uh, but you know, sort of encapsulating my students' puzzlement, you know, this uh, there's almost 100 million uh, Chinese Communist Party members now, and so you know, many of you are Chinese. This might not be a contradiction to you, but for people, uh, you know, coming at this from the West, uh, it is a surprise, uh, and and that's really the main audience. You know, the audience for the book is really Western readers to try to help, uh, you know, sort of understand uh, the, you know, China more from the grounds up a bit more. Uh, one other sort of piece of introduction. So, you know, the book we wrote very much for uh, a general interest audience, although there are a variety of charts, graphs, and, you know, if you look in the footnotes, you know, a variety of interviews and regression um, tables, but uh, it's based on a number of peer-reviewed academic journal articles, but we try to write it in a more sort of engaging, um, Style. Uh, we think we succeed a bit. It actually was one of the, the fi Financial Times best books of 2022. Uh, so it's um, great. So, so this idea of my students um, being puzzled, 
I think also extends through the policy establishment and businesses as well in the, in the US. Uh, so, you know, traditionally, you know, thinking about, um, you know, the combination of markets and a more state-run, state-driven, um, you know, communist or socialist uh, society, uh, the theories predict that, you know, as a country economically liberalizes, that democracy or at least political liberalization will follow. You know, this was very much, I think, undergirding most of U.S. policy, um, you know, for most of the period since reform and opening. You know, the ent when China entered the WTO in 2001, Bill Clinton said something to the effect, I don't know the exact quote, but, you know, this is, you know, the equivalent of a one-way street, meaning, you know, it's going to be opened up markets, uh, and then, you know, surely democracy um, will follow. And this, you know, particularly um, in the, you know, the last sort of, you know, five, ten years, um, I think has been proven to be an inaccurate uh, assessment. Uh, another um, point, and this very much, you know, so I grew up in the U.S., 1970s, 1980s, and, um, you know, this was the height, you know, not, not exactly the height, uh, but still there were sort of lingering uh, discussions of, you know, the, this, this, the, the communist system in the Soviet Union and, uh, you know, just inefficient and it was it collapsed under its own weight. And the idea being that, you know, this, you know, part of the reason why perhaps, you know, you know it, it'll lead to, to, to political liberalization is just that, you know, the thinking is that these um, communist systems just can't, you know, fundamentally work over the long term. There will be a lot of inefficiencies, not a lot of innovation, et cetera. And I think China has also sort of shown that assumption to be um, false. Uh, another thing you see uh, or hear um, is about the flexibility in post um, reform and opening. Uh, you know, I'm sure you probably all, you know, recognize what this cartoon means. This is Deng Xiaoping. Uh, you know, holding a black cat and a white cat, you know, famously, he said, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a black cat or a white cat as long as it catches the mouse. The, the meaning being that, you know, yeah, I mean, well, maybe some things will be planned, some things we market, but, you know, if they all work and lead to economic growth, I'll, I will adopt all of those. Um, uh, so one of the reasons why is I've been thinking about this and some, you know, and again, my, uh, my training is you know, more in general social sciences as opposed to sort of a, like a traditional Chinese studies um, person or someone who studies Chinese history. Uh, so that means, you know, sociology, psychology. And one of the areas um, that I haven't done a lot of research in this myself, but I've, I've done, uh, you know, certainly some, a lot of reading in it is around cross-cultural psychology. You know, there's a very robust literature around cognitive styles around the world and how they vary. And that in the West, um, you know, people see things in much more of a uh, independent fashion and aim to categorize and separate. Uh, so for instance, you know, one study that this really stands out to me is um, uh, a study of parents um, in how they, you know, sort of socialize and communicate to their children. So they took uh, you know, parents around the world and they brought them in, I assume they into some lab or maybe they went to the, the researchers went to their house, I don't know, and gave them some toys uh, and said, oh, can you, can you talk to your, your kids about these toys? And so, you know, the toy was a doll, a doll and a truck and the, the parents in the West, uh, I think it was in the U.S., would describe, okay, you know, this, this is a doll, you know, here, arms, legs, uh, truck has wheels, you know, door, a bed, you know, really describes how, um, you know, understand the differences between them and separates them. Whereas in the Eastern cultures, it was actually much more of a discussion around the interrelationship. So, you know, this doll could be driving this truck and a variety of things to describe um, sort of the interrelationship. So the sort of long, long story uh, short, I think that, you know, when we in the West have tried to really understand, um, understand the Chinese system, uh, we think of it very much like 
you know, the state and market being separate uh, in, in a very fundamental way. And in the West, there's, you know, discussion of tensions between sort of the state and the market. I think a lot of the political discussions, particularly in the U.S., is, ha, has centered on that. But in China, I, you know, what I think people, I think people more and more nowadays are coming to understand this, um, you know, don't recognize that, sure, you know, this, there is some, some differentiation, but you know, they all fall under the, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And so, you know, Deng Xiaoping can say things like, you know, the, you know, the state and market, uh, you know, are both tools. Well, because those tools are both actually, um, you know, controlled by the, the, by the Chinese Communist Party, which sits above the state, sits above, uh, above the market, you know. So, so I think that, you know, one of the things we try to, you know, focus on in the book is really sort of understanding you know, the deep roots of the sort of ideology and politics um, and, and how the CCP uh, leads everything. Um, so I probably have too many motivation slides. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, I think this is particularly important and, and part of the sort of psychology of this that relates and, and all these things, I think I'm sort of separating them, but I think they're all somewhat connected is, you know, another psychological concept is a confirmation bias and this is something where we look for evidence that confirms our existing beliefs uh, or existing sort of mindsets. And so I think that, you know, on the prior slide, we maybe, th you know, think of things, the state and the market as separate. And so we look for things that confirm that in, uh, in the structure of China. I think also we're seeing this in the rush um, of investors, of business back into China after uh, the COVID opening. Uh, and I think that a lot of the messaging from the Chinese leadership to Western audiences is sort of about how, you know, we're open in China. You know, you have Liu He at Davos, Li Chang at the National People's Congress, and just recently the China uh, Development Forum, uh, Xi Jinping himself saying, you know, we're open, we're supporting business, we're stopping these, you know, crackdowns on technology company, you know, please come. And I think this is like, you know, you know, business in the West, or at least the U.S. as I, I know better, sort of is salivating, you know, to get back into the, uh, to the market. But I think that, you know, um, maybe these are just sort of in some ways uh, confirming what we uh, believe and we should think a little bit more about, uh, you know, some of these other sort of more hardline type things. Oh, I'm having problems with this. Um, Okay. Okay. Around, you know, she himself, you know, not necessarily communicating the West, but, you know, in closed door meetings with party members about, you know, basically rejecting Western models and China need to be self-reliant uh, and, um, you know, focus on really its own internal model. You know, there's been a number of a little, you know, pretty frightening to me um, stories of not just people being, um, you know, sort of disappeared, so to speak, but also a number of uh, offices of multinational companies being, um, you know, sort of being inspected for ideological reasons. So, so I, I still, you know, people ask me, you know, should we go back to China as a business? And I say, well, you know, I know they're saying a lot of stuff about how open it is, but there's a lot of other things that may you know cut in the other direction and i think you should st people should still be careful so th i think that this, the, our arguments and discussion have a little bit of contemporary relevance as well um, so i'll skip over this so anyway so yeah uh, you know so my training isn't is, is and i should say people should jump you know please jump in and and you know i, I was telling the people before i've talked about these slides a number of times, actually your questions and if you're challenge me or, or every, I mean, it's probably more interesting and fun for all, for all of us. So please feel free to, um, free to jump in. Uh, we try to orient the book for a more general interest audience, but we do have in some ways a little bit of a, you know, sort of theory development uh, perspective too. And this is around uh, the idea of how early leaders in countries uh, have an enduring influence on the institutions, on um, you know the culture, uh, and you know you can you you can see so there's a variety of studies uh, in this idea of sort of imprinting. 
uh, which actually originally is from the bioecology literature um, and Conrad Lorenz, but it's been applied in sociology, psychology, some in economics to really understand, you know, sort of how and why uh, early leaders um, continue to have an effect. And so, you know, we'll, I'll talk a bit about how sort of our research helps, uh, helps inform that. Um, okay. So I'll say a little bit about sort of how we unpack sort of, you know, sort of if you think about this idea of imprinting and then, um, you know, you know, Mao is really, you know, not the founder of the CCP, but an influential early leader and then really the sort of founding president of the China People's Republic of China. Uh, you know, a variety of reasons why his ideas still continue to resonate. Uh, today uh, with, um, you know, with people in China. So one is uh, education and socialization. So, you know, of course, of the 100 million almost people that join the CCP, they sort of go through a variety of, uh, maybe some of you have done this, you know, sort of classes, workshops, you know, watching documentaries, reading, writing, having mentors, et, et cetera, that actually you know, really helps you, um, help socialize you into this party. Uh, but also, you know, there is other um, channels as well whereby it affects the entire population. So one of those is education. Uh, one of the other reasons why I wanted to sort of, sort of thought about doing this set of research is so uh, immediately before I was at, uh, at Cambridge, I was at Cornell in the United States. And I was on an admissions panel uh, at Cornell of a, um, for, for a PhD program that I, I was part of. And I was scanning some, some applications on my computer one day. And I came over a Chinese transcript and it had, you know, uh, sort of Mao Zedong Sishang, you know, like sort of, you know, Mao thought as a class a student had, had taken. I said, that's a really interesting class for a, for a student to be taking. And I looked and it was like a required class. And I looked, the student had actually taken a couple, two different levels of it as a required class. Uh, and I looked at, at the other Chinese students' transcripts and they had taken the same uh, thing. And after talking to a variety of Chinese friends, they said, yeah, so through at our schooling, um, we are taking a variety of ideological classes. Um, this probably isn't surprising uh, to, to many of you. Uh, we don't believe them, they say, um, but, you know, or at least the people that I talk to, we don't believe them, we, you know, they're the sort of things we're not interested in, but still they take them. And I think about it a little bit, like, you know, I, when I grew up, um, I, uh, my family's uh, religious background is Catholic, and so I used to have to go on Sundays, didn't like going, didn't like, but I think still it has a deep influence to, on me that I've actually studied uh, and learned about these things. Also, you know, tourism, uh, you know, during the 100th, in, in media, 100th anniversary of the CCP, uh, which just was in 2021, 20, uh, you know, hearing about all the different movies, television programs around the revolutionary period, around Mao, around a variety of leaders, um, you know, very, um, you know, this is continually communicating. And even things like, you know, red tourism, uh, which, you know, you probably, uh, some of you have maybe, I don't know, been to some of these different sites of the revolutionary uh, history of China that are, you know, celebrated tourist locations. So I, uh, a number of years ago, probably eight or nine years ago, I was actually doing a study um, of a company in Changsha in Hunan province, which is not that far from Mao's hometown, maybe a two to three hour drive, his hometown of Shaoshan. And I went there, uh, it was really interesting. You know, I'm someone who is really interested in history, Actually, I was in a PhD program in history at some point in, in, the, in the past, and I've been you know, in the US to places like Monticello and Mount Vernon. You know, the, those uh, are, you know, sort of Monticello is Thomas Jefferson's home, Mount Vernon, George Washington's, and you, know, you go there and they're pretty, you know, not very vibrant, active places. You know, very nerdy type of people are there, um, like myself, I guess. You know, going to, um, um, you know, the, um, Go, going to Miles' hometown, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, I was telling someone this and they said, you know, that sounds like Graceland. It was more like Graceland, actually, which if you don't know, is Elvis's, uh, uh, you know, hometown. It's, um, or home, you know, 
hugely overrun with people, uh, markets, people, you know, hawking a variety of Mao products from sort of plates to statues. I actually have in my office at Cambridge a Mao statue uh, that I purchased. <laughs> that I purchased there has a stamp of Shaoshan uh, on it, so I know I got it in his hometown. Uh, anyway, so so there's a lot of ways that these ideas and that continue to be uh, enforced. Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is uh, I mean, I think that that, um, yeah, I mean, the state and party can have very, very strict control over what is communicated. And I think that many of this is what is communicated in some ways, you know, positively about, you know, Mao, the party, et cetera, but then also the ability to restrict. And so I just saw something reported just in the past couple of days that, uh, there was a video uh, posted around about um, sort of so someone who had talked to, and it was because in Chengdu, which is where I've spent a lot of a lot of time, uh, a older woman that um, you know basically she she did not have nearly enough money to live, uh, and that was very this very sort of emotional. And he took her to some supermarket and bought her, and this was deleted from the internet um, because you know the 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 idea that the party and Xi Jinping had eliminated poverty is, you know, a, a very important, um, uh, you know, sort of legitimizing force and the fact that this shows some of the struggle and destitution that exists, um, you know, so yeah, so it has been sort of wiped from, so there's all, I mean, that's just, I mean, there's a lot of that and it's, um, and I think with AI, I mean, and um, I mean, it's it's sort of, you know, I mean, another sort of mistake of the West, not to sort of beat up on Bill Clinton's quotes, but, you know, he, around the same time, had this other evocative quote, not, uh, was, you know, the Internet's coming. You know, you can't stop the Internet. It's like, it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. Uh, and that obviously, you know, has been actually the opposite. It actually provides a much more robust way to actually monitor and control. So I think, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, good question. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, institutionally, also, there's many um, features. So, you know, I mean, I think part of this does have to do, I mean, I mentioned the Soviet Union, you know, the, um, I mean, the, the party uh, knows, or at least has a theory, which I think is a re reasonable one, of how and why the, the Communist Party of, of the Soviet Union fell. Uh, and part of that was sort of negating its sort of prior leaders and ideology. And, uh, you know, this has led to this idea of historical nihilism, which, you know, you can get in sort of pretty big trouble if you don't, you know, sort of follow the accepted history. There's documentaries about this also around the, around the, the anniversary of the CCP. Um, I think, you know, also, you know, institutionally, something that's not as well known in the West but, you know, this idea of reform and opening that, you know, Deng Xiaoping articulated in the late 70s and, and, and early 80s, and I think it was written in the Chinese constitution as well, uh, was actually one of two basic points, and it was the second one. The first one was a number, like four other points around, you know, making sure to, that the party is still, you know, at the center of, uh, of the governance, following Mao, and I, f I forget exactly what all those points were, but, you know, again, I think in the West, uh, you know, we're, it makes sense to us that people would want to reform and open, and so we just have really focused on that aspect, but actually not really considered the other aspects. So I think there are a lot of still ideological, or excuse me, institutional, in addition to ideological uh, reasons, or ide ideological um, and institutional mechanisms that create this lasting, um, lasting effect. So, uh, yeah, so it's even more important nowadays because uh, uh, Xi Jinping does, I think, draw a lot on many of the sort of discourse and, um, and you know, institutions uh, that Mao developed. Uh, a little bit about the methods uh, we use. 
So you can see here, I mean, a lot of the work that we, uh, that I have done in my research uh, and we've done it in a variety of different of these peer reviewed uh, um, um, papers I, I mentioned, use quantitative data. So one important data set is, is a survey of entrepreneurs that goes back into the 1990s. Uh, another is, uh, you know, the, the, the CISMAR is, you know, a database of Chinese public companies. Um, uh, so which has a lot of information on them. Uh, we also hand collected a, bu a, a bunch of data on politicians, uh, sort of backgrounds and resumes uh, to see how they also correspond to some of what we're uh, finding. And then we, we also analyzed, there's a database of, of sort of all the people's daily and the provincial dailies um, and, and did a bunch of, of interviews as well, particularly about the questions for this book. So, you know, I've, during my time in China, you know, in interviewed um, hundreds of entre mostly entrepreneurs, business leaders of multinationals, of SOEs. Uh, but for this book in particular, we have, um, we interviewed 32 uh, folks to really try to understand these questions that we're, that we're asking around sort of, you know, maintenance of ideology and its effect on, on business. Uh, so let me just go through the organization of, of the book, uh, and then I can say a little bit about some of the analyses we've done. And again, please. So we have uh, sort of three sections in the book. So trying to understand Mao's influence. Um, we have one is ideological and military principles. Uh, these include things like you know, self-reliance, autonomy, independence, you know, sort of around this nationalism, anti-foreign uh, sentiment, uh, frugality, uh, devotion, you know, this, you know, serve the people, mass line uh, ideas, and then a variety of military strategies as well. So, you know, a lot of Miles' military strategies have been um, uh, applied to business and I think to, to, to pretty good success, many of them, um, uh, campaign. So, the second sort of set of, set of uh, examinations we do, in addition to military, so Mao uh, and this, you know, the, uh, um, and the CCP more generally has had a variety of very important campaigns uh, and really governed through a variety of campaigns. Uh, this goes back, you know, sort of uh, in Yan'an rectification, um, you know, a long time example. Uh, the ones that we're gonna look at in this book are The Great Leap Forward, uh, the Cultural Revolution, which probably you're, you're familiar with, and, and some which some of you are familiar with, maybe it's less known, is a third front construction whereby, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in the 60s, uh, when, um, you know, China was facing, you know, threat from both the West and from the Soviet Union, so sort of in some ways enemies on either side, um, you know, they moved a lot of the military, industrial, even some universities into hard to reach central mountainous regions. And this has had actually a, um, a lasting impact on entrepreneurship and the uh, uh, and business. And then finally, we look at some institutions. So this is in some ways a structure of China, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the, um, you know, the economy and business. Uh, so one is, um, you know, political centralization, economic decentralization. Uh, so, you know, the fact that, you know, there's actually a lot of economic decentralization, so you can have things like, um, uh, you know, special economic zones and, and other things where you can experiment and grow, which varies, differs from the Soviet Union. And then a variety of ways of uh, control of private businesses. So this is something that's actually been in the news quite a bit recently uh, with some of the, you know, crackdowns on the tech firms, uh, you know, discussion of this idea of golden shares, which is when the, you know, government buys a small stake in a company, like for instance, Alibaba, which they've done, and ByteDance, uh, which they've done. Um, and with that, they get the, the most important board seat and veto power. Um, and so this is a mechanism of control uh, of private economy uh, firms. There's also party branches, which has also been in the news. Um, and these are, uh, you know, sort of, organ you, know, um, you know, organizations of party members within companies. You know, so Manchester University may, you know, have, I don't know, 
I don't know how many Chinese students there are here actually, but some, some percentage of them are, are CCP members. There's probably you know, some organization here of uh, party branch, but in it, within both private firms, but also one of the reasons why it's been in the press a lot is that uh, and a lot of uh, foreign companies, uh, multinationals in China like HSBC or Goldman Sachs, you know, there's been this increasing push to have party branches, which has led to a number of um, media, media uh, articles and, and variety of denouncements. So, okay, so let me, um, I'm going very slow, I, I apologize. Uh, I have a lot, I, I've, I'm gonna go through just one of the areas to give you a sense of sort of in some ways the evidence that we sort of marshal and then maybe we can open it up uh, more generally. So, uh, so this idea of sort of nationalism that we study. Uh, so this is, um, you know, the idea of sort of China standing up, uh, you know, overcoming its century of humiliation, you know, you know, bringing China together used to be sort of this loose pan of sand and he's gonna sort of solidify it and it's gonna stand up, uh, sort of make, make China great again in some ways. Uh, uh, so this is something that, you know, was, was discussed a lot and, uh, and, you know, focuses on a sort of autonomy and self-reliance. Uh, so what our interest is around this, and so again, this is, this is one of the chapters in that first part of the book where we look at sort of ideology and how it affects business. Um, you know, we look at a lot of other things, but this is just this one, sort of one, one of those chapters. So what we're interested in then is, um, you know, uh, is the business national in, in ways that may actually help hurt its economic viability? Uh, does this vary based on the, um, extent of sort of socialization and communication uh, into the CCP. So those are some of the questions. And so, so our, some, our, our sort of supposition is that, you know, if you come up into the CCP during Mao's era um, in, in the variety, in some variety of other factors that we look at as, mod, as moderators, uh, that you will have this much deeper sense of nationalism, which will then be displayed in your firm's behaviors. So I'm gonna skip over this, but go back to it. So anyways, so we, we did this, we, we, looked at the, we looked at this question um, uh, with, in some ways, three different ways. So we looked at the entrepreneurial data, we looked at the private, uh, the, the public company data, and we also looked at this in our interviews. And so very simply, uh, and I don't wanna go into, um, the excruciating detail, there's you know, academic papers on this that I'm happy to send you, but if you think about, there are uh, in some ways like four types of entrepreneurs. So we look at this data you know, that has you know, 20,000, you know, about five to 6,000 entrepreneurs, you know, 20,000 observations. Uh, so one set of those are these entrepreneurs I mentioned that were socialized into the CCP uh, during Miles' era. So probably communicated much more, you know, sort of these, uh, you know, Mao, Mao, I, Mao type ideas. Uh, another type, still CCP members, but actually enter the party after a form an opening when maybe, you know, the, um, the sort of explicit focus on Mao, Mao's ideas are not as much. And then there's groups that, that actually did not join the party, both during Mao's era and, and, and then not. So, you know, we're interested in how these uh, four different type of entrepreneurs may run their firms in different ways. And this, this is something where we can control for industry, you know, even their age, their, you know, there's, a, there's you know, these are very, um, uh, you know, detailed and robust econometric models. And, and, and so what we find is that, you know, if you are one of these folks that joined the CCP during Mao's era, there's a lot of ways in which you are sort of, you act in an anti-foreign way. And I should note that this is something that, you know, we studied this in a time period when actually the Chinese government was explicitly encouraging firms to be global, go out, uh, you know, the provincial city government was uh, incredibly focused on GDP. And so, you know, these entrepreneurs in their daily environment have a lot of encouragement to actually you know, be foreign. Uh, uh, but what we find in all of these different data sources that they, 
actually, you know, are much less likely, you know, much less likely to invest abroad and also much less likely to do a variety of other things like accept uh, foreign investment, which we sort of take as, as evidence that, um, you know, they, they have been, their sort of, uh, you know, propensity to do so uh, is reduced. Uh, I, I should say, so, so this, I skipped over this, you know, this actually is found in our um, interviews, uh, you know, in, in the book we have, the, you know, the interview schedule we, we, we did, you can look at the different questions, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions that we looked at, and, and, ba ba and generally as well, when we look through the interview transcripts, the, the, even the words uh, and phrases that were used uh, were, were different, um, you know, things like much more likely use self-reliance, autonomy, independence. Uh, we also analyzed of the public company firms, you know, the public statements of the, those CEOs. Uh, so, you know, if you're a CEO of a public company and, and you are, again, one of these like deep red, you, you also are emphasizing these, uh, these same ideas. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll okay, I have that. I'll skip over that. Um, okay. I mean, this is important, I think, because, you know, nationalism has only increased. It's um, being, you know, sort of stoked in some ways by the, by the government. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's this well of it. And I also think, you know, one of the reasons why um, I think this is important to understand is that, you know, there is this also discourse in the West, and I think it is from wishful thinking a bit, that, you know, a lot of the, you know, sort of messaging around, um, you know, or promotion of the CCP ideas by entrepreneurs is mainly, you know, just a display. Like they have to do this to be to be legitimate. And there was this article on foreign affairs not that long ago by Kevin Rudd, who you probably know. You know, he was the prime minister of Australia for a while. He's now the Australian ambassador of the U.S. You know, you know, speaks good Chinese and has you know studied China a lot. And so he even said in this article, he said, you know, the, he, in the the point of the article was that, that actually, you know, Xi Jinping's taking a third term is like a step change in governance in China. Uh, and he was saying that, okay, you know, when you would talk to officials, you know, they would talk about, you know, their, their commitment to the party, but he was like, oh, it was, you know, this sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, like they didn't actually believe it. But our results suggest that actually there are very deep beliefs uh, and, and commitment to those ideas uh, among the, the among the part among these individuals, and it's not just display. You know, another sort of quick story of mine that really, again, sort of, you know, I, you know, was when I started going to to China or living in China a, a, a bit. Um, you know, I again was not a traditionally changed chain, China scholar, um, and but I was at the time. So I was for, for 12 years a professor at Harvard, both at the business school and the, the Kennedy School, so could get very good access to leaders uh, to interview them, to do case studies. Was, and so I had gone uh, one day early in my time, so probably 2011 or 2012, to the office of the CEO of Costco, which is a major Chinese shipping um, uh, company, and you know, walk into his office, um, and right there, you know, sort of in my face is a giant statue of Mao with, you know, the, the flag of the CCP and, the, you know, the flag of the, you know, the, the state flag of China. And this was, you know, again, I mean, this was sort of early in my time going there. I was, it's like my students, you know, I was a little puzzled. I mean, is this something that's just a display that, you know, he needs to actually do this to, you know, sort of in some ways fit in, you know, sort of socially and it's legitimate, but actually, you know, what our findings suggest is that there is, you know, because these company, these individuals are actually operating their businesses differently, uh, that actually these are ideas that have stuck uh, in some way. Um, I'm not gonna say much about the military. This is actually not, I mean, I mean, we wanted to do this just out of completeness, but there's been a lot of discussion of how Mao's military ideas have influenced Chinese firms uh, probably the most famous of these is the sort of surround uh, the cities from the villages strategy, which Huawei used originally, Pindodo um, has used. The idea being that, you know, uh, well, this is actually a big, in, a very important insight of Mao. Uh, uh, you know, traditional, 
you know, Marxist-Leninist uh, revolutionary theory is that you um, organize the workers in cities, and those are like sort of the vanguard of the re revolution. Um, and the Chinese Communist Party tried that for a while and failed. And then Mao's idea was that, you know, this is, doesn't make any sense. China is an agrarian country with a huge rural population. We should actually organize the countryside first and then take the cities. So this sort of surround the cities from the villages, uh, which the, like a lot of Chinese companies view this. So th this is not a, you know, the most novel part of our book because other people have talked about this. Uh, okay. So, so that's a sign I should, uh, <laughs> yeah, I also want to get your comments and questions and, and everything. So maybe it's a sign that I should just stop. Uh, any questions? Will? I'll or, ask a question. Well, sure. It's more uh, specifically related to um, my five arguments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Over the years, I think there's been, you know, an acknowledgement or admittance by the state that, you know, some taking some responsibility, and I don't know if that's been attributed to Mao or you know, removed from the gang for and to Mao more over the years. But um, I was wondering how that's imprinted. It's, you know, this ideology has sure. affected this imprinting on on uh, the general populace. Because my opinion when I was living there was that as this acknowledgement has become more and more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. That's an interesting question. A, a couple of sort of thoughts on that, and I think it's sort of we're, you know, sort of are sort of he heading to that a bit. Uh, so, you know, I would agree with you. I mean, so the time period that I spent, you know, between 2010 and 2020, you know, three and a half to four years of that time, I was, um, I spent in China. And I would agree, you know, I mean, I think that there was actually a little bit more open discussion of, of these issues. Uh, but I don't know if in the last number of years that has actually reversed itself. So one piece of evidence uh, around that is from what I understand, you know, there, I think it was a third edition of the official party history that was done around the centenary. And uh, it actually dramatically reduced the discussion of the Cultural Revolution. I mean, even, you know, I've been to, you know, on the Tiananmen Square, there's the museum of uh, China. I don't know what it is exactly. National Museum. And there is a big exhibit around, you know, the revolutionary history of China. And there is like a, a little like corner that has something on the Cultural Revolution, um, which, I mean, that's like a 10 year, that's a pretty large percentage actually of the People's Republic of China, but, um, but it, it, it merits a little, little corner. So I, I don't know how much that is acknowledged uh, a, anymore. I think, yeah, from this 2021 onwards, kind of, yeah. that Cultural Revolution 2.0 idea has just been yeah. on it, but certainly when I was sure. 14 to 19, yeah. there was serious yeah. acknowledgement from the, the younger population. Yeah. Um, so what, what I'm going to—I'll just say something quickly about it, actually, because you mentioned Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward. So, uh, so what we look at there, and then I'll just use this slide and just talk it through a little bit, and then I would again love to get comments. Uh, so we look at again, sort of entrepreneurs and business people who lived through these experiences, and how that has shaped a variety of factors and how they run their firms. So on the Great Leap Forward, uh, you know, this was you know this you know, tremendous human tragedy and disaster where, um, you know, like in the famine that followed, you know, 40 million, 30, 40 million people died, you know, I'm sure, you know, hundreds of millions of people suffered and, and through starvation, et cetera. So not to discount the tragedy, but we try to look at actually how going through that has had, in some ways, a positive effect. And this is something that entrepreneurs talk about. Uh, so, you know, a number of entrepreneurs are on the record as saying, actually, the grit that that gave me from going through that, um, you know, ha has had this lasting effect on my, you know, sort of even creativity, commitment to business. And this is not necessarily just a phenomena that one would attribute to China. There's actually research in the United States, um, mostly of individuals that have gone through the Great Depression period. And I know my grandparents went through the Great Depression. I, 
I see this in them, actually. There's these, you know, they actually find that leaders, business leaders that have gone through the Great Depression end up running their companies differently than ones that have not. They're a variety of, you know, sort of a little more risk averse, um, save more. And that's generally what we find of these entrepreneurs and business leaders that actually haven't gone through the great leap forward. You know, you actually, again, sort of run your company in a different way. One of the things we find um, is, um, is actually uh, try to get at ways of these entrepreneurs in some ways being more innovative as well. So there is this company, uh, Wanxiang, you've heard it's, um, it's a company, of, I think it might be the largest, if not one of the, lar it's, um, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, auto parts suppliers uh, in, in, the, in the world. Uh, and the founder of that company, uh, you know, the, the name Wanxiang means you know, 10,000 directions, uh, his original invention was a ball joint um, that he, took from, he was able to create from scrapped tractor parts. And he sort of attributes his creativity to actually having gone through the, you know, in, 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 fi in finding these scrap parts and being able to transform this into a business, which is, you know, uh, is now, I'm not sure how large it is because there's a lot of these different subsidiaries. So, so we actually look at that through a variety of ways and find as well that these um, you know, entrepreneurs are more able to, um, you know, to in some ways, do new, new and more innovative uh, uh, things. Uh, just in, in the final thing in regards to the Cultural Revolution, since you mentioned it, I hadn't planned on, on actually uh, um, talking about that much. Uh, uh, there is literature in political science and economics that analyzes how individuals that have gone through the Cultural Revolution have, uh, uh, I don't say trust issues might be a strong way to, <laughs> to, uh, to they're sort of a weird way to put it, but sort of they uh, are, less trusting of institutions, they are more likely to um, um, in some ways ignore or evade institutional guidelines. Uh, and that's generally what we find as well, that the entrepreneurs who live through that have, um, yeah, they're actually more likely to be sort of fined by the government, more likely to um, be put on these sort of lists of shameless uh, um, and other, other types of things. Um, with that, why don't I stop? Uh, I've gone on probably too long. Uh, happy to, you know, I gave you sort of the outline. I don't know if you remember it, but I'm happy to talk about other features or other chapters as well. Uh, again, I know that it's hard to talk about a book because there's just, I mean, it's a lot of things there. Um, uh, so hopefully it wasn't too superficial and would love any questions. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes, hey, in the back. I'm sorry, you had your hand up earlier. I apologize. I didn't, yeah, I didn't get you. Yeah. Sure, interesting. I mean, I'm sure we could benefit from re reading that. I mean, I think as I sort of try to sort of extrapolate, maybe that, you know, in particular that might uh, apply. Although, I, you know, I do think that, you know, a lot of what we're looking at is actual, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, sort of behavior of companies. Um, and, 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 you know, what we're trying to trace is sort of, yeah, going, going through the Great Leap Forward, going through the Cultural Revolution, uh, you know, whether your city was a third front construction uh, city, um, you know, whether you're talking about things in actually the same language that Mao used in your, you know, not just in the interviews where we ask about it, but actually just in the, um, you know, sort of the uh, general, dis you know, discussions you might have. Uh, so I think those uh, aspects, I do feel actually connect 
you know, to Mao, um, you know, pretty, pretty strongly. Um, you know, I, I can see where, you know, if you want to make sort of say, okay, you know, the current governance of China, you know, if you want to make that connection, uh, which, and I did sort of make that, I, th I think that, you know, I think you're totally spot on uh, that, that we, you know, I think there's a lot of thinking to be done around, um, yeah, what was sort of the political economy of China, like how can we actually understand it from a more general perspective? Uh, and I think that, you know, some of the problems we've had is people's not doing that. So I think, yeah, so a lot of our analysis, I think because of we're looking at firm level behaviors that tie specifically to these Maoist things, I think, you know, I, I think we can make those claims, but I think if we're gonna try to extrapolate, I think you're, that's a good point. Yes. Um, thank you for your insight and okay. presentation. And I, uh, you just talked about the cultural osmosis is affected by the Mao's idea of Chinese people. So I also curious about how the cultural affected by the market or the idea by Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's new idea. Yeah, we have to wait 40 years and then we can sort of <laughs> collect, collect data on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that so, Again, and I do think that, um, you know, I mean, to, to the, to, so I think the, you know, you know, good question for, for a comment from the back. Um, you know, there is, uh, you know, this set of, you know, propaganda processes that occur. Uh, and, I, and I think these are definitely not Mao. I mean, these are actually more generally, um, you know, um, sort of part of sort of authoritarian or potentially sort of Leninist um, strategy. So I think more and more you're seeing, I mean, you know, there's a software, you know, Shui Shi Changguo, there's, um, you know, huge promotion of, you know, Xi Jinping. You know, I, I um, like, like, I think, you know, I, we do have a lot of this, the, the, the sort of the people's dailies from Mao's time, so could, could probably could make a comparison, but it seems just outrageous to me how Dominant that through the discourse um, uh, she needs to be, and so um, so I think that you know you know based on our findings, even though people may say, oh you know I don't believe any of this stuff, you know my workplace makes me do the Shui Shi Changguo, I don't believe it, but still actually um, going through those things actually does have have an effect on people's minds. I mean I. You know, sort of mentioned my experience with uh, going to Catholic <laughs> school. Um, you know, again, I was resistant and didn't want to do it, but it actually, you know, having all that communication, you know, and even you know, my times I spent in China, you know, you do sort of get used to, um, you know, back at those times, the, the you know, particularly early in the time, you know, the VPN, using VPN was not as easy. So actually, I didn't really rely on Google. I wasn't accessing the New York Times. I, you know. Um, and, and that, I mean, probably I missed a lot and I saw things that, or I missed things that probably they didn't want me to see. Um, so it's a very good question and I don't uh, have a good answer, but I do think, yeah, there's much to be said about, you know, sort of ideological control and propaganda, um, the power of it. Most surprising thing, geez. Uh, this is like 10 years of, uh, um, I mean, I, I think some of the uh, stuff around the Great Leap Forward um, and that, you know, just the fact that actually, I mean, people say these things, but actually that those entrepreneurs and the business they run ended up in some ways being more innovative and creative and we could actually see that. Um, you know, and again, I mean, not to discount the tragedy that occurred, uh, but I mean, it, yeah, that's sort of inter interesting. Yeah. yeah and I'm curious, like, in the book or like for your investigation, uh, to what 
then do you think that Mao's like economic legacy, if we want to call it like that, is rooted on Marx actual ideas and how much it's like really like a more pragmatic uh, situated version of like what communism would be? I think he's very pragmatic and situated. I mean, I think that I think there, I just read something in the common media around this. Actually, I don't know, but but so I'm not again. I mean, my background is more understanding, you know, firms and Chinese, you know, the variation among them. And I'm not a scholar of Marxism, certainly. Um, uh, but my understanding is that it, he very much sort of adapted and modified it for the, for the Chinese, um, you know, uh, populace on uh, situation. I mean, still to the, I mean, that said, I mean, still though, I mean, there, if you look at even China today, there's still a uh, very significant, um, you know, state control of key industries. And I think that if you look at the recent moves around data and technology, I think is, is um, you know, you know, data is now an official factor of production for, you know, as articulated by the Chinese Communist Party. And so, you know, labor, capital, you know, it's not sort of the big industries, but this is, you know, I think, this, this golden shares phenomena and increasing crackdown on these techno, tech companies, you know, is a result of, you know, you know, data is now seen, you know, it's not like, you know, just letting Jack Ma, you know, sort of, you know, run an auction site and, and develop this Al Alipay app is, I mean, you know, good for economy. It's actually now, it's actually a, you know, strategic factor of production which fits into sort of Marxist theory. So I think that there is certainly, it's a very difficult question and probably beyond my depth to fully answer, but I think that there's a lot of evidence of customization to China, but then still, even to this day, there's, you know, deep, um, you know, Marxist uh, beliefs. I mean, she, you know, quotes Marx, but he also quotes Adam Smith a lot too. So, so it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy. <laughs>